So every time I sit down to film a case like today's, I don't know where to start. Like, hey, thank you for clicking on this video. I hope you're ready to have your day ruined. Kind of kidding, but also not really, but also please stay. <laughs> Hello, best friends, and welcome back to our safe, cozy little space in the wild, wild west that is the internet out there. And welcome to this chat that I wanted to have with you today. Yeah, intros will always be awkward. I don't know why I feel like I'm sitting down to give a class presentation, like I'm literally going to whip out a PowerPoint on you all. But I hope you're all doing well, super well swell even. If you are new here, then hi, hello, my name is Liz and I am so happy that you're here, as is my beautiful co-host Lily, our resident emotional support angel who joins us for every single hangout because she refuses to be locked out of the room while I record. <clears throat> Can anyone say codependent? It's me, by the way, I'm the codependent one. So today we have a big case. So big, in fact, that I can't fit this whole debacle into one video. And so welcome yet again to yet another multi-parter deep dive. <laughs> I always feel funny about doing multi-parters because I know some of you don't like the weight, which I totally get because me too, but I know some of you love the multi-parters because you know I get to go into way more detail than I usually would in one video. And if that is you, strap yourself in now because good Lord, do I have details for you today? Like I have been obsessed with this case. And don't worry those of you that are like, but the wait, Liz, because part two will be here very soon. And I know that because due to some unforeseen production issues, your girl filmed part two before she sat down to film part one right now. <laughs> It's a long story. Don't ask too many questions or I might cry at you. But Lily knows all about the stress that was involved. Okay, so in this series, we are going to be talking about Australia's longest unsolved serial killer case. And the crazy thing is you probably haven't heard of it. I would love to be telling you right now that as well as this being Australia's longest unsolved serial killer case, it's also one of our most notorious, most covered, most well-known. But that's not accurate. It has received a little bit more traction in the last few years. And luckily those that have covered it have done a phenomenal job. Like there is a podcast and a documentary that just came out last year that were really helpful in my research. And I will include links in my sources to those if you decide that you want to do some digging on your own. But this case is now over 30 years old and this serial killer is still walking free to this day. And if you've been here a while, you know that I always pop a disclaimer up at the start of the video so that you guys have a general idea of what you're getting in for. But now for this case, I'd like to add like a more casual disclaimer as not a doctor. If you have like high blood pressure or are just having a particularly angry day today, then maybe just take a few breaths right now, like deep breaths to ground yourself to prepare for what's to come. Because there were times during my research of this case where I literally had to get up and walk away from my laptop or I was going to punch it or like throw it out the window. There has been tears, there has been swearing, there's been all of the emotions. So if I get a little bit sassy today, I apologize. That is the only way that I know how to passively, aggressively express my inner rage. But like with all of that said, Let's get into it. So we're going to start off today by meeting Colleen Ann Walker-Craig. Colleen was just 16 years old when she was last seen alive, and she's been described by her loved ones as vibrant, well-liked, and just brimming with promise. Colleen's mum, Muriel Craig, has said that she was the kind of person that got along with everyone, so she had a lot of friends. And Colleen was also infamous amongst her family for her practical jokes and jump scares. And at just 16 years old, Colleen had a 
strong moral compass. She didn't have a problem with telling someone if she thought what they had said or done was wrong. As the second eldest of six children, Colleen was a huge help to her mum when it came to helping with her younger siblings, especially one of her younger brothers who had a wheelchair and special needs. Colleen loved kids and at age 16, that age where you've literally got the whole world at your feet, but you're still in that awkward stage of figuring out who you are and what you want your life to look like, Colleen had decided that she wanted to be a teacher, specifically a pre-primary teacher. And at the time of her disappearance, she already had some work experience under her belt and a certificate working to make that dream a reality. Colleen was mainly based in a small town in New South Wales called Sortel with her mum and siblings, but she was also independent and would travel quite often between towns to visit family and friends. And so nothing was amiss in September 1990 when Colleen gave her mum, Muriel, a hug and a kiss as she always did before she left the house and made the 45-minute journey south to Barrowville, leaving her mum, Muriel, with no idea that this would be the last time that she would see her daughter alive. Bowerville is a small country town nestled in the Nambuka Valley in New South Wales, approximately halfway between Sydney and Brisbane. And at the time of Colleen's visit, Bowerville had a population of about 1,100 people, roughly 350 of which were Indigenous. And we're going to go just like a smidge back in history today. And please forgive me in advance for what I'm sure is going to be me butchering the pronunciation here. But the Gumbangia people are the traditional owners of the Nambuka Valley and the land surrounding surrounding it. And they had lived there for literally thousands of years before Europeans first made contact in March of 1841. As is the case with a lot of other countries that have gone through a colonization process, Australia has a very long and very horrific history in how its First Nation Indigenous people were treated during that colonization process and in the years following. And in this series, I feel like I am unable to give the detail deserved to all of the injustice and terror and pain that Indigenous Australians have suffered and continue to suffer to this day. Like we're talking attempted genocide, people having their children stolen away from them and these children having their culture and identity stripped away intentionally. We're talking nuclear and biological warfare. I feel it would be disrespectful of me to try and sum everything up in just a couple of paragraphs here in a video related to a different topic. And so instead, what I'll do is have links in the description to sources dedicated purely to this topic. In particular, there is a docu-series called First Australians by Blackfella Films and SBS, which I would highly recommend. Back to our case, though, early on in the 1870s, Barrowville was a small timber town, and it really followed the same trajectory as a lot of other timber towns in Australia, thriving and growing rapidly at first to accommodate all of the timber workers. And so it had two hotels, a post office, several general stores, a school and a couple of churches. But as the timber industry declined, the town remained stagnant for a good long time until the 1980s when it began to take on tourist appeal for people living in Sydney and other close by cities who found the town's old timey historic main street called High Street charming and endearing with its cute shop fronts and iconic 1940s picture theatre. What these newcomers and tourists often wouldn't see though was the other Bowerville, just down the hill on the southern edge of town. The mission, often referred to as the Mish was where a lot of the town's indigenous population lived. It was made up by a single road called Cemetery Road, lined on one side by a row of small simple houses and on the other side by a park that had a big gum tree in it where a lot of the neighbours would hang out together. And the Mission was located really very neatly between the town's cemetery, the piggery and the dump where the parents on the mission would actually prefer that their children play rather than them wandering onto High Street in town where they were worried that they might be targeted by the non-Indigenous residents living there. So it really was like two separate Bowervilles. So it probably goes without saying that along with a lot of other small towns in Australia, Bowerville had a history rife with racial tension and segregation. So much so that in 1965, the town was 
was specifically targeted by a bus tour called the Freedom Ride, carried out by renowned activist Charles Perkins and a group of university students protesting the blatant discrimination and segregation of Aboriginal people in small town New South Wales. And Charles Perkins very nearly started a riot when he went to the picture theatre on High Street, now a movie theatre, and attempted to purchase a ticket at the ticket booth at the front because... This wasn't allowed. In the 1960s, when Charles Perkins visited, if you were Indigenous, you needed to go around the back of the theatre to a side entrance to buy your ticket. And you were only allowed to sit on the dirt floor right in front of the screen in the neck crick section. There were two pubs in town, the top pub for the white-collared white business owners in town and the bottom pub for the harder working white farmers. And this was where the Aboriginal men were allowed to drink, but they were only served from the back window and never from a glass. God forbid that a white person drink from that same glass later. The white children and the Aboriginal children were taught in separate school classes. The Aboriginal women in town were not even permitted to give birth in the hospital. In fact, Aboriginal people weren't treated in the hospital at all. They were instead assigned to a small room off to the side of the building that only had one bed. Jumping forward back to September 1990 when Colleen visited Bowerville though, things had changed a little bit, although the seating was still segregated in the cinema. Also, there were still two pubs in town, one for the non-Indigenous and one for the Indigenous. And just day-to-day -day things like in the stores on high street, white people would be served first, even if they were last in line. According to one resident speaking about Barrowville in the 90s, quote, the racism in the community was palpable in those days. It is still there today, but a lot of people do not see it. But then you could not miss it. It was that strong. Colleen herself was no stranger to Barrowville. She'd been there plenty of times before and had both friends and family living on the mission. And Colleen was last seen alive at around midnight on the 13th of September, 1990 walking away from a group of friends that she had been chatting and drinking with at a party held at one of the houses on the mission. Unfortunately, it would be days before anyone even realized that Colleen was missing because she had been planning on leaving the party at around midnight that night anyway to catch the train with friends to another town. And so when midnight was the last time she was seen, Everyone at the party just assumed she had left as planned. It wasn't until Muriel called one of the friends that Colleen was supposed to catch the train with that night that she found out that when the time had come to leave the party and catch the train, Colleen had been nowhere to be found and so they had had to leave without her. And so trying not to panic, Muriel made phone call after phone call trying to find out where Colleen was and she quickly came to the sickening realisation that no one had seen or heard from Colleen since that party. And so on the 17th of September, Muriel made the trip to Barrowville Police Station with a photo of Colleen in hand to report her daughter as missing. And with all of that groundwork we did on the history and racial dynamics in Barrowville, it's probably going to come as very little surprise to you right now when I tell you that the response she received from police was lackluster at best. When Muriel showed police Colleen's photo, they actually asked her if she was sure that Colleen was her daughter, commenting on her fair skin and agreeing amongst themselves that she didn't look Aboriginal to them. And then completely unconcerned that this 16-year-old girl hadn't been seen or heard from in three days, they told Muriel that Colleen had probably gone walkabout, that she had probably wandered off to some other town and would turn up eventually. At the station that day, police never took an official statement from Muriel. They never made any mention of filing a missing persons report. And Muriel knew that as an Indigenous woman, if she made a scene in that station, she would run the high risk of being arrested and placed into custody. And so instead, Muriel quietly left the station, photo of Colleen in hand, knowing that it would be up to her to find her daughter. And shortly after this, she uprooted her whole family and moved to Barrowville so that she could search for her daughter and hopefully bring her home safely. 
At this time, it was pretty much just life as usual for the rest of the residents in Barrowville, though, because Colleen's disappearance wasn't really taken seriously, even by other residents of the mission. That is until just three weeks later, after another party at a house on the mission, another child vanished into thin air, literally just a door down from where Colleen had last been seen. Evelyn Clarice Greenup was just four years old when she disappeared on the 3rd of October 1990. Evelyn was the eldest child to her mother, Rebecca Statums, and the first daughter to her father, Billy Greenup, and she had two younger brothers named Aaron and Aidan. And at only roughly a year apart, she and Aaron were especially close, to the point of being inseparable. Like if you saw Aaron, you saw Evelyn, and vice versa. Evelyn was described as a shy and gentle little girl who was always smiling, but wary of anyone unfamiliar or going anywhere on her own or being separated from her family. Like one of Evelyn's favorite things was said to be going on a walk with her family, but you better believe that that whole walk, Evelyn had to have a tight grip on either her mum or her dad's or one of her auntie's hands. One of Evelyn's aunties said that she was so quiet that you could quite often forget that she was even in the room until she was tugging on your clothes, asking for a glass of water. And quite often it would be Evelyn's younger brother, Aaron, that would speak for her. Evelyn's big loves were playing with her siblings and her cousins and being out in nature. And there was rarely anyone that met her that could resist commenting on her big blue eyes and light brown curls with people often likening her to a miniature Shirley Temple. The party that took place on the night that Evelyn went missing was at her grandmother Patricia's house on the mission where Evelyn lived with her mum Rebecca and her two younger brothers. And this party was a big event. It had started in the mid-afternoon and gone late into the evening. There was a lot of people, a lot of alcohol and weed, and consequently, it was pretty rowdy. At some point in the evening, after a disagreement with her mother over whether the kids should be at the party, Rebecca grabbed Evelyn and the boys and took them next door to where their father, Billy, lived, hoping that he would be able to look after the kids. But she was fresh out of luck when she got there and realized that Billy was too intoxicated to take care of the children. So, Having had a fair amount to drink herself, Rebecca took the kids back to Patricia's where the party was starting to wind down anyway, and she and all three kids went to sleep in the same bed in one of the bedrooms. Rebecca awoke the following morning feeling particularly groggy. She had slept the whole night through, which was rare. Usually she would be up at least once making a bottle for her youngest son, but she hadn't woken up at all. And now this morning, she had a particularly bad hangover. Looking around her, Rebecca saw her two boys sitting side by side playing quietly on the bed, but Evelyn was nowhere to be seen. And so Rebecca asked the boys where their sister was, but they weren't really able to answer. And so Rebecca headed out and asked her mum, Patricia, and Patricia told her that she hadn't seen Evelyn since they had all retreated to the bedroom the previous night. And so probably feeling those first inklings of panic creeping up, Rebecca went and asked Billy and a few other party goers if they had seen Evelyn, but no one had. And then when she came back to her mother's house mid-morning, Rebecca saw something on the front lawn that made her heart drop. There was one of Evelyn's little pink sandals lying on the grass in front of the house. Evelyn's auntie, Michelle Jarrett, came home at about 6 p.m. that night to find her sister, Rebecca, beside herself, having been searching for Evelyn all day. So Michelle grabbed a photo of Evelyn and her sister, Rebecca, and headed to the police station so they could report the little girl as missing. A police officer was just on his way out of the door of the station when the sisters arrived, and so relieved that they had caught him just in time, Michelle and Rebecca showed him Evelyn's photo and explained that this four-year-old little girl was missing and had hadn't been seen since the previous night. And I don't know what the usual protocol should have been at the Barrowville police station when a child is reported missing at knockoff time, but according to Michelle Jarrett, this officer's response was something along the lines of, well, what do you want me to do about it? I'm the only one here and I'm about to clock off. You'll have to come back tomorrow. It would be days before the police would look seriously into Evelyn's disappearance and file a missing persons report. And just like Colleen's mum, Muriel Craig, Rebecca had the officers ask her if she was sure that Evelyn was her daughter because she had blue eyes and fair skin and light hair. And just as they had in Colleen's disappearance, police suggested to Rebecca that perhaps Evelyn had just gone 
walkabout. And I'm sorry, but we have to hit pause here again because it had been insulting enough three weeks earlier when police had suggested that the 16-year-old Colleen had gone walkabout. But I need you to understand how maddeningly absurd it was for police to suggest that the four-year-old little Evelyn Greenup had gone walkabout. So what is walkabout? According to OutdoorRevival.com, historically speaking, walkabout is a rite of passage in which young adolescent Aboriginal Australians undertake a journey that will help transform them into adults. And depending on who you ask, traditionally it would be young Aboriginal males between the ages of 10 and 16 who would undertake this journey, which can last for up to six months, during which time the individual can travel a distance of over 1,500 kilometers or about 1,000 miles. And this young person must survive by themselves in the wilderness all of that time and distance. They have to be able to create some form of shelter to withstand the elements. They have to be able to source clean water and food by combination of hunting and fishing and being able to distinguish edible plants versus plants that will kill them if they eat them and also medicinal plants if they become ill or injured. And so with all of this in mind, there are quite literally years of planning and teaching that go into preparing a young person for this epic journey before it takes place. And it's not left up to the individual or even their parents to decide when they're ready. It's left up to the elders in the community. There's actually some variation of this rite of passage, this coming of age tradition in most cultures in the world. And there's even a push to introduce the tradition in some form into Western culture because of all of the rich life benefits and lessons that are to be gained from the experience. Like the overwhelming majority of people who have been through some form of walkabout say that it literally made them the person that they are today. Like they wouldn't be who they are without that experience. And just so that we're all on the same page, I'm sorry, Sandra, but your gap year in Europe does not count. I'm sure Paris is wild, but it's not the wilderness. Now, unfortunately, in Australia, the term walkabout has taken on different meanings to different groups, and it's been used very often in an ill-informed, derogatory and discriminatory way by non-Indigenous people to stereotype Indigenous people as living these nomadic lifestyles, always coming or going and never being in one place for too long. Even more unfortunately in this case, it was used by the police as an excuse to not do their job and do everything in their power to find these missing children. And we can hit play again now, hopefully that we're all as equally outraged that the police suggested that four years old Evelyn Greenup had simply gone walkabout. Because Evelyn was just four years old, police felt a little bit more pressure to attempt to find her. Like she was obviously a little bit harder to write off than the 16 year old Colleen. And so they conducted an investigation that involved a couple of searches, but they quickly lost interest again once they spoke to a couple of witnesses who claimed to have seen Evelyn in the sweet shop on High Street in town the morning after she was supposed to have disappeared. And we'll be talking more about the supposed sightings later in part two, but basically now instead of continuing any search efforts to find Evelyn, the police turned back on Rebecca, her mum, and the rest of the family, asking them where is Evelyn, suggesting that they had had something to do with her disappearance. And so now finding themselves under suspicion, Evelyn's family were left to continue their desperate search for Evelyn, holding their own searches and giving out flies to all of the shops in town to put up in their window fronts. And the police investigation into Evelyn's disappearance had all but fizzled out when four months later, on the 31st of January 1991, a third child vanished from the mission. Clinton Thomas Speedy DeRoe, affectionately known as Bubby to his loved ones, was just 16 years old when he went missing. Clinton has been described by loved ones as incredibly kind and gentle and strikingly caring to those around him. And it's said that he had a beautiful heart and could cheer up anyone with his silly sense of humor. Because of his caring, gentle nature, kids were always drawn to Clinton and he would often be seen with a baby on his hip or pushing a pram with just a trail 
of other little ones hanging off him. And Clinton's dad, Thomas DeRose, says that Clinton would have made a great dad and wishes that he had the chance to see him grow up and become a father. Clinton loved football and was a talented player as well as being a talented artist and a very fast runner. And he loved Michael Jackson and had mastered all of his signature moves. And so according to those that knew him, Clinton could be straight up deadly on the dance floor. Clinton had lived most of his life in another small New South Wales town called Tenderfield, but he had recently moved to Barrowville because he wanted to be with his dad, who lived on the mission just doors down from where Colleen and Evelyn had disappeared. Before he left, Clinton told his auntie not to worry when she said to be careful because she had heard of the disappearances and she told him that whoever was responsible was still on the loose. And Clinton's older brother, Marbuck specifically remembered the last thing him saying to Clinton being to remember to come home in February for his 18th birthday. But unfortunately, Clinton would never get that chance to celebrate his brother's birthday with him. Once in Barrowville, it didn't take Clinton very long to make a couple of friends and also strike up a romantic relationship with a girl named Kelly Jarrett, who happened to be a close friend of Colleen's. And this relationship became real serious real quick to the point where Clinton and Kelly were basically inseparable by the night of the 31st of January 1991, when they both attended a party at a public housing flat not far from the mission. By the night of this party, Colleen had been missing for five months and Evelyn had been missing for about four months. And the community were only just starting to suspect that their disappearances might be connected. And this party was much the same as the others. There were a lot of people, a lot of alcohol, a lot of weed, and Clinton and Kelly were having a perfectly good time. And then at around midnight, Kelly was approached by one of the men at the party and he asked her if she would like to come back to his caravan once the party wound up so that they could watch some music videos and have a few more drinks. And Kelly agreed on the condition that Clinton be allowed to come to, which the man had no problem with. And so at about 3 a.m., all three of them headed to the man's caravan not far from the mission. And once there, Kelly had a few drinks, Clinton laid down on the double bed, and all three of them just kind of hung out and watch music videos. The next morning, Kelly awoke at about 8.40 a.m., feeling pretty rough and drowsy, having slept particularly heavy. And to her surprise, she realized that there was no sign of the man or Clinton, and she had been left in the caravan alone. And when Kelly got up, all she needed to see was Clinton's shoes on the floor of the caravan where he had left them the previous night, to know that something was very wrong. And so she quickly grabbed the shoes and headed straight to Clinton's dad's house. So basically everyone that knew Clinton knew that he was very fashion conscious. He took great pride in his appearance. He was always dressed in the latest and greatest brands. And this applied in particular to his shoes. The Reeboks that Clinton had been wearing at the party, the ones that Kelly had grabbed from the floor of the caravan, had been a Christmas present from his dad, Thomas. And from Christmas Day onwards, Clinton never took these shoes off. He was fussy about them. He took care of them. Like it was a running joke in his family that the only time Clinton was without these shoes was when he was showering or sleeping. And so when Clinton's dad, Thomas, saw Kelly standing on his doorstep that morning holding Clinton's shoes, she didn't even need to say anything. He also immediately knew that something was wrong and that something had happened to his son. And so he called the police to report Clinton as missing. And if anyone's wondering, yes, I am starting to feel a bit like a broken record when I tell you that, of course, the police were entirely unconcerned with Clinton's disappearance. They couldn't or wouldn't understand the significance of Clinton leaving his shoes behind. And they told Thomas that Clinton had probably wandered off or you guessed it, gone walkabout and that he would show up eventually. Thomas was told that he would have to wait at least 24 hours before filing a missing persons report. And so he spent that whole day on foot out and about in town looking for his son alone, being told the same thing over and over by party goers from the night before, that none of them had seen or heard from Clinton since he and Kelly had gone to the caravan the night before. 
Thomas called police again the following day and again was told that he was unable to file a missing persons report. But when Thomas continued calling and the police faced mounting pressure from the Indigenous community, seeing as this was now the third child that had gone missing from the mission within five months, they sent one single police officer to assist Thomas in the search for his son. The man that owned the caravan that Clinton had last been seen alive in was interviewed on the 4th of February five days after Clinton had disappeared. And he told police that when his alarm for work had gone off the morning after the party at about 5.15 to 5.30 a.m., he had been so drunk that he just hit snooze and rolled back over to go to sleep. He said that he hadn't fully fallen asleep though before he heard someone, presumably Clinton, leave the caravan, which he allowed police access to. But No forensic testing was completed and after a quick look over everything, police were satisfied that the man had had nothing to do with Clinton's disappearance and that if Clinton had been a victim of foul play, it must have occurred after he left the caravan early that morning before Kelly woke up. The suspicions were felt to be confirmed after police spoke with a couple of witnesses who claimed to have seen a boy matching Clinton's description hitchhiking out of Barrowville the morning he was supposed to have gone missing. And just like the sightings of Evelyn that we mentioned earlier the morning after she was supposed to have gone missing, we're going to be delving into these sightings more in part two. In early February, understandably frustrated at police's inaction and lack of concern that now three of their children had gone missing, members of the Aboriginal community demonstrated out the front of Barrowville Police Station. And I'm just trying to remember if I warned you guys that I was going to get sassy today. I think I did. I did, didn't I? Yes. So the senior inspector on duty that day, Bob Moore, came out and told the demonstrators, and I quote, to do this investigation properly, we've got to have you people on side working with us. And if you're with me and feeling like the word investigation there feels just a little bit rich, it just got worse when another officer came out and assured the demonstrators that if they had the evidence to arrest and charge somebody, he would be charged. Hello, Lily girl. Yeah. So in any of our cases, have you come across one where the evidence just like up and collects and admits itself? I'm drawing a blank. You are right. There is not one that comes to mind, right? After this demonstration, it was like police finally realized that these families were not just going to forget that their children were missing and leave them alone. And so knowing that if they didn't do something, they would most likely have an all out riot on their hands. The Barrowville police decided to bring in some detectives from the North Region Major Crime Squad, as well as other detectives from Coffs Harbour to head up an investigation investigation into the disappearances of Colleen, Evelyn and Clinton. Enter Detective Sergeant Alan Williams, who despite what you might expect was not a homicide detective. In fact, Detective Williams had exactly zero experience in homicide investigation because he was a child protection detective with the child mistreatment unit in Coffs Harbour. And there are a few different reasons for this, some mostly speculative like Coffs Harbour not being all that far away from Barrowville. And so there was no major cost involved in bringing Detective Williams in. But it was mostly because no one else wanted the case and police still weren't looking for a predator targeting Indigenous children living on the mission. Instead, Instead, Detective Williams' instructions going in was to look into the families themselves because police still believed that the victims' families most likely had a part in their children's disappearances. In later years, Detective Williams admitted that in his belief, his superiors rated his chance of solving the disappearances as nil, and it would be decades before the families would find out that during this time, they themselves were under police surveillance having their comings and goings monitored on a day-to-day basis. When it came to Evelyn's disappearance, one of the favoured theories, according to one of the notes from a senior officer, was that Evelyn's mum, Rebecca, was a heavy drinker and knew that she was going to be approached by family and community.
community services and potentially have her children removed from the home. And so she sent Evelyn away to prevent her from being taken. It was the 18th of February, 1991, that two men searching for firewood in bushlands on the eastern outskirts of Barrabool discovered the remains of 16-year-old Clinton Speedy DeRoe just over two weeks after he had vanished. There had been no attempt made to bury Clinton's body. He had simply been dumped alongside Congarini Road, about seven kilometres from the mission, and his remains were severely decomposed, having been out in the heat and humidity all of that time. Clinton was wearing the same clothes that he had been wearing at the party and in the caravan the last night that he had been seen. And close to Clinton's body, there was a blanket that presumably Clinton's body had been wrapped in before the animals had begun to scavenge his remains. A deep wound was clearly visible on Clinton's head and an autopsy would later reveal that his jaw had been broken and he had been stabbed multiple times. And so now, finally, police were left with no other option than to accept that Clinton hadn't just wandered off. He had been the victim of foul play. There was a piece of fabric found pushed down the front of Clinton's shorts. And when one of the officers removed this piece of fabric, he realized that it was a pillowcase. And then he realized that he recognized both this pillowcase and the blanket that had been found near Clinton's body because they both matched items that he had seen when police had been allowed inside the caravan where Clinton had last been seen alive. For years, the man that lived in this caravan that invited Clinton and Kelly back there with him that night, his name was not known to the public. He was simply known as a POI or person of interest in the case. But these days with a Google search, you can find out his name real quick. And so hopefully there's no legal ramifications in me telling you right now that this man's name was Jay Hart. In 1991, Jay Hart was a 25-year-old laborer working at the tanning factory Hanging Hides. The caravan he lived in was on the same property where his mother, Marlene Hart, lived with her boyfriend at the time, Noel Short. And this property was kind of located smack bang between High Street, the main street in Barrowville, and the Mission. It's said that Jay and his family came from old money, but Jay didn't really have a lot of friends up on High Street. Instead, despite being a non-Indigenous white man, he was readily accepted and welcomed on the mission, regularly attending parties there, readily welcomed by the community, and he often brought with him a surplus of free alcohol and marijuana. Some even referred to Jay as the king, probably in part due to his tall, stocky stature. Like at 185 centimetres tall and 105 kilos, Jay was definitely a large, sturdy man. Like you couldn't miss him. But on the mission, he was just one of the lads. He was really quite popular and got along with most everyone there. Although he did throw up some red flags. For instance, some of the residents of the mission couldn't help but notice that Jay had a certain penchant for the Indigenous women living there, especially those that were younger or even underage, making no secret of plying them with booze and weed that they couldn't purchase for themselves in what seemed like a concentrated bid to win their affection. Also, when Jay drank too much or got too stoned, he could become volatile and violent and had been told on more than one occasion, buddy, you're drunk, you need to go home. The mission had actually been home for Jay in the past when he had been in a four-year relationship with Alison Walker, who was Colleen's auntie, and the couple had a son during this time. They lived together, so Colleen, being Alison's niece, had been familiar with Jay, but the relationship had ended due to alleged physical abuse on Jay's part, including Alison alleging that Jay had punched her in the face when she was seven and a half months pregnant. There had been another incident in April 1990, just months before Colleen disappeared, where Jay had gotten into an argument with a couple living on the mission that resulted in Jay headbutting the woman and then punching the man in the face, then leaving very briefly and coming back with a golf club, which he then used to attempt to smash his way through their door, all the while threatening to bury them under his marijuana plantation, a plantation that was conveniently located 
not all that far from where Clinton's remains had been found. It took police 10 days after Clinton's body was discovered with a pillowcase from Jay's caravan shoved down the front of his shorts to make their way back to Jay and his caravan and tell him that they needed to take it for forensic testing. Oh, and also because the Aboriginals might trash it because of word spreading around town that Jay had had something to do with Clinton's murder. And the police, of course, asked Jay, you know, why would there have been a pillowcase from your caravan found in Clinton's shorts? And Jay suggested that maybe Clinton had gotten up early that morning and stolen the pillowcase to use to steal marijuana from his plantation on Congarini Road, you know, as you do at 6am with no shoes on. Before police took the caravan for testing, they also asked Jay if he needed anything from inside because, of course, he did live there and Jay was allowed inside the caravan once again at a time, mind you, when it was possible to basically erase blood evidence by simply wiping it away. But rather than Jay grabbing like a toothbrush or deodorant or clothing or I don't know, underwear, whatever you might expect, the only thing he wanted was his dumbbells, his weight. And he was allowed to take them, despite police knowing that their victim, Clinton, had died of head trauma. Head trauma that Clinton's family believe and forensic testing has since confirmed very well could have been caused by a blow to the head with one of those weights. But these weights were never able to be tested or examined or used as evidence because they were never seen again. And it's believed that Jay disposed of them shortly after being allowed to take them from the caravan. The blanket that was found beside Side Clinton's body that Jay's own mother confirmed to police in initial interviews matched the blankets that Jay used in his caravan. Yeah, that blanket was also never able to be tested or used as evidence because, and I kid you not, it was arranged for it to be washed. So after mishandling these items that could have been and probably were central pieces of physical evidence in Clinton's case, police finally interviewed Jay for a second time. And when they found that sure enough, Jay's story about his movements on the morning that Clinton had disappeared just did not add up, Jay was arrested and charged with Clinton's murder on the 8th of April, 1991. It was about a week later on the 17th of April that two fishermen on the Nambu a river had one of their hooks snag on a belt and pair of jeans that Colleen had been wearing the night that she was last seen. When police arrived on the scene, which by the way, was pretty much right down the hill from where Clinton's remains had been found, a search was conducted and the rest of Colleen's clothes were found, gathered in plastic bags and weighed down with rocks. Colleen's mum, Muriel, and the rest of the family had been desperately searching for Colleen for the last eight months now with no assistance from police. Like Colleen's younger siblings, remember that after their big sister went missing, whenever they weren't in school, they were out with their mum searching for their big sister. Unfortunately, to this day, Colleen's body has never been found, but it would be over a decade before a coroner would finally find that Colleen had deceased and it had been the result of a homicide. Because I think in most people's experience, clothes don't tend to usually gather themselves up and weigh themselves down with rocks in rivers. And then just 10 days after this, at about 4 p.m. on the 27th of April, the skeletal remains of Evelyn Greenup were found in bushland, just about three kilometres from where Clinton's remains had been found. As with Clinton's remains, there had been no attempt made to bury Evelyn's little body. She had simply been dumped alongside Congarini Road. And just like Clinton, her cause of death had also been a penetrative injury to her skull. Evelyn's remains were found during a search of the area by police and SES, prompted by alerts from locals that there was a foul smell in the area and alongside her body was a pink sandal matching the one that Rebecca had found in the front yard months earlier that police had suggested early on in the investigation meant that Evelyn had simply wandered off. But like we said, when Detective Williams from Child Protection was brought in, police had gone down a different route, believing that all three cases were unrelated and that in Evelyn's case in particular, her family had been responsible for her disappearance. In their investigation, detectives had asked at least one witness about rumors that Evelyn had been sold by her family. And this was after Clinton's remains had been found and Jay was the main person of interest 
interest in his case. Detectives even questioned Evelyn's grandmother, Patricia, about a payment that they noticed had been made into her account, suggesting again that they had sold Evelyn. However, this payment was actually Patricia's war widow pension from Veterans Affairs because her husband had been a Vietnam vet. But my God, finally, now confronted with the facts that all three victims had gone missing within five months of each other, that two of the victims had been murdered in startlingly similar ways, and that two of the victims' bodies and the clothes of another had all been found within just a few kilometers of each other, police finally conceded and accepted what the families had been trying to tell them all along. Their children had not gone walkabout. They had been murdered, and they had all been murdered by the same person, a serial killer targeting Indigenous children living on the mission. And with Jay Hart already behind bars awaiting trial for Clinton's murder, the next step, of course, was to link him to the murders of Colleen and Evelyn, which police found was alarmingly easy. And I hope you guys will join me for part two, where we'll be digging into that, plus the potential motives behind all three murders, plus multiple trials, plus a reinvestigation, which pretty much just blew the case wide open once again, and even changes to 800-year-old laws. Like, this case is insane and we are nowhere near done. I would love to, of course, hear your guys' thoughts so far. Is this your first time hearing about this case? And if so, are you just like, how? What are your thoughts on the investigation so far? If you could call it an investigation. Thank you so much for spending this time with me and Lily today, guys. If you're not already, make sure you're subscribed on YouTube or following me on Spotify and make sure you turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on part two, which like I said, I've already filmed. So it's going to be out super fast, like lightning. Do you have any thoughts to share so far? Are you mad? Are you sad? What's going on in that little head? Me and Lily hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and we will be counting down those hours until we see you in part two. Bye.